Welcome to Adama Farm. So excited to show you around today and eventually at some point, hopefully, to show you around here in person. But today we're going to really focus on defining some of the terms that we use when we're talking about agriculture and gardening and in particular regenerative gardening. And the term regenerative really tries to get at this idea that um, not only are you being sustainable on a farm, but actually what you can do is you have this capacity to build soil, to increase biodiversity, such that you're actually building toward the future, not just sustaining what's already here. So let's go check it out and learn some of the vocabulary that we'll be using. So every time you harvest a crop, you cut it down, let's picture a cabbage, you cut out the cabbage, you eat it, you're, you've got nutrients, you've got energy to go through your day, and you've got to replenish the soil somehow for what you took out. There are lots of different approaches to fertilizing the soil. This is, of course, one of our favorites in regenerative gardening and farming, and it's compost. And all it is is it's the waste of a previous crop, manure, uh, leaves, grass clippings, whatever plant material, whatever biomass, whatever animal material that you have, rotting, all the microbes are doing the work for you, to break it all down and turn it into something stable. So that's a, a finished pile over there um, that's been sitting for about a year. It's been turned, it's been watered, and now that compost is totally stable. You can pour it on your crops, and, well, ideally on the soil before you plant your crops, and rejuvenate the soil that way. Whenever you're spreading any fertilizer on your field, you're going to do it at a different rate depending on what your soil needs. So if you just need a little bit of compost, you're going to do a light application like this. And if you want a whole bunch of fertility, then you're going to do a thicker application. And it just depends on what you're working with in your soil. So after you spread compost, you have a choice. You can either integrate it and mix it into the soil, and that way you'll really bury it and um, and use more of the compost, or you can leave it on the soil surface. If you put it in, put it on really thick, then you kind of use it as a mulch and you can shut out weeds um, with the thick compost. And it's not quite as, an efficient, as efficient of a use of compost, but it's a great um, version of mulching. Now I'm gonna tell you about basically my very favorite part of farming. What it's called is cover cropping or green manures. And it's a way of fertilizing your crop with plants. So the idea is that certain plants, when they grow, they put certain nutrients into the soil and also just the biomass of them, the fact that they've photosynthesized, grabbed all that um, energy out from the sun and using carbon dioxide to make sugars, make um, carbohydrates, food. Um, you can either eat it or you can put it back into the soil, that food that plants make. And when you put it back into the soil, you're fertilizing the next crop. So right here, I'm surrounded by hairy vetch. It's um, gorgeous to look at. Not such a gorgeous name, but um, it's an incredible nitrogen fixer. And what that means is that it's actually taking nitrogen, which is a really commonly limiting um, nutrient for plants, a, a nutrient that plants really need that they often don't find enough of in agricultural soils, unless you add it. Um, it can grab that out of the atmosphere by a symbiotic relationship with rhizobia bacteria, and they can then put it into the soil. So on our farm, we do a lot of planting of cover crops, and then we either mix it into the soil, um, or we, we leave it on the soil surface, and we actually plant right into the residue of the cover crop, or we, um, we use it as a mulch um, after we cut it down um, and apply it somewhere else. Another way of fertilizing a crop is one that is not allowable in, under organic certification, and it's called industrial uh, fertilizer. And what it is really is um, in a factory, they take a lot of heat, a lot of pressure, and actually um, manufacture nitrogen. So what I told you about those cover crops being able to put nitrogen right into the soil, um, manufactured fertilizers can do that too. Um, they'll look like little pellets and they'll be um, really a fast release fertilizer, meaning that they're very soluble in water and very available to your plants very quickly. So um, if you're not taking a regenerative approach and using a fertilizer like that, you'll see a result very quickly, but you'll also um, pollute quite a lot because it's so soluble in water, it's gonna 
um, wash right into whatever the plants don't take up, which they can't take up all of it quite so quickly. Um, it'll wash right into our watersheds and causes quite a bit of pollution. The other thing that people don't always recognize about those fertilizers is that they're very fossil fuel intensive to produce. So it's one of um, the big contributions to greenhouse gases um, from agriculture actually is the production of those fertilizers. So when you use compost, when you use um, byproducts from um, the agricultural industry, other types of organic material, um, when you use cover crops, you are um, fertilizing your crop and growing big healthy crops without those types of fossil fuel intensive fertilizers. There are also essential mineral nutrients that plants need. So if you get a soil test, um, what you're going to want to look at is if you're deficient in any of your macronutrients, meaning nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus, or any of your micronutrients. Um, and those are uh, nutrients that are essential to the growth of your plants, but you only need a very tiny little bit of them. So you can apply those nutrients um, through all kinds of different products that you can purchase. Um, and again, you really need a very small amount. The more regenerative you are, the less you're going to rely on outside inputs. So if you want to keep it simple, I'm going to say use a lot of really high quality compost and grow cover crops and you're going to be good to go. So getting the right soil moisture is so important for your crops. If the soil is wet all the time, which is a common mistake I think gardeners make, you know, they use a hose and they're just watering um, and keeping the soil, soil saturated all the time you're gonna end up with a lot of fungal diseases. And if you let your soil dry out too much, then your plants aren't gonna be able to access all the nutrients going on in the soil, um, much less water, which they also need to grow. So you really wanna get that balance. Um, and there are a few different ways to water. Um, one of them, and this is the one we usually use on our farm, is drip irrigation. So this tube, you can see every foot, it has a little um, emitter, and right now it's full of water and it's, you want to get the right pressure and then it's going to let out um, drips of water every foot. And that is a really efficient way of watering, meaning that you're not losing a lot of water to evaporation. So it's a really um, good way of conserving water when you irrigate. And the um, water is going right where you want it. Um, next to this tomato plant here, it's, um, it's going to be right, right where I want it rather than watering weeds anywhere else. Um, and when I'm monitoring how wet I want the soil, my goal is really to be able to stick my finger in the soil. And if it's wet about, you know, my, my index finger length, then, then I've, I've done a good job and I can turn it off. Um, you want to really get it, get it wet down, down in there and then let it dry out. One of the things that I've found over time is that if I water really deeply, infrequently, I get the best results because the roots of the plants are reaching down to meet the water as far down as it goes and allowing it to dry out a little bit then um, prevents those fungal diseases, but keeps, my, keeps the roots of the plants looking for, for that water and then accessing more nutrients in the soil. Sometimes all you've got is a sprinkler and that's fine. And they spin and let the water out and pretty straightforward. So knowing what plant family each crop is in is really useful. Um, by, pl by plant family, what I mean is um, plants that are genetically similar enough that they share certain traits. So we've got the cucurbit family, which includes zucchini and cucumbers. And this cantaloupe is also a cucurbit. So you can see that they have some physical properties in common and they also have a lot in common in terms of how you want to grow them. Um, they're going to share really similar pests and diseases. The cucumber beetle likes a cantaloupe leaf just as much as it likes a cucumber leaf um, and they all die when downy mildew comes. So um, there's, there's a lot in common with how you're going to grow the um, plants in the same family. Peppers and eggplant are also in the same plant family. They're solanacea. And so certain things you can manage really similarly. Both of these are on landscape fabric because they both are plants that originated in really warm climates and they like really warm soil, which the black plaster fabric here helps to um, create. Um, but then there are things that they don't have in common. For example, um, the flea beetle absolutely loves eggplant leaves. You might be able to see these little holes in the leaves. 
Um, and the, the pepper, um, flea beetles apparently couldn't care less about peppers. I don't know why they're so picky. But we managed them a little differently for those reasons. So for example, when these were really small, we had row cover on top of them. This is an example of row cover here. And it's um, a white, well, it doesn't have to be white. It's a fabric and there's different kinds of it, but it's a great tool. If you have a lot of pressed pressure, you're gonna be able to cover your, your crop with the fabric and exclude those pests without spraying anything. You're gonna be able to exclude them just with that physical barrier. Now, once our eggplant got to be this um, big and once they started to flower, we needed to take the um, row cover off, not least because we wanna be able to see these gorgeous flowers, but also because we want the bees to be able to find them so they can pollinate and we can end up with the very beginnings of delicious eggplant um, thanks to those um, partners in the process, the pollinators. And so to clarify what I was saying about the row cover, um, the reason why you would protect the crop when it's so little but not really worry about it too much when it's bigger is because if you imagine the flea beetle, you know, it's about this big. If our plant is about this big, and the bug takes a bite out of that um, that plant, it's gonna be a high percentage of the total leaf surface is gonna be eaten. Whereas if a flea beetle takes a bite out of this plant, sorry pal, you can't take me down, I'm so big. So um, you really wanna think about that when you're protecting your plants, that when they're little, little seedlings, that's when you really wanna um, be vigilant. And as they get bigger, they just get so much more resilient and tougher. Another example of a crop family is the alliums. So onions over here, you can tell look pretty similar to these little leeks down here. And um, those are gonna be really similar too. We keep these extra well watered because they have very shallow root systems, um, both the leeks and the onions. And we're not quite ready for it yet, but while we're here, you can see an example of the importance of weeding. Haven't quite gotten to these onions yet. They're still doing pretty well, but we got to weed these pretty soon. All the crops we've looked at so far are annuals, meaning that we had to plant them this year. You have to um, plant them each year in order to get a harvest. So when you're deciding how to design your garden, you're really going to be thinking about, do I want to grow annuals and plant them every year? Or do I want to grow perennials? So let's take a look at a couple examples of perennials. These blueberry bushes are examples of perennials. We planted these about 10 years ago and uh, here they are, they've grown so big and lush. Each year we do need to take care of them and you will, um, there's another session coming up later in the summer with Adama at Home about uh, perennials and you'll learn a little bit more about taking care of something like blueberries, hazelnuts, and these currants. Perennials are really important to regenerative farming and gardening because you don't have to disturb the soil. You keep all the carbon that's already down in the soil, you keep it there. Obviously we know We've got too much carbon in the atmosphere right now. We want less of it in the sky, more of it in the ground, and perennials are a really important part of that. So speaking of wanting to keep the carbon in the soil, use the magic of plants to pull carbon out of the atmosphere and store it in their bodies, what um, a lot of regenerative farmers and gardeners are doing is trying to figure out how do we disturb the soil less? How do we prepare a bed to be planted into without um, necessarily disturbing the soil because every time you disturb the soil you release some of that carbon you lose some of that carbon into the atmosphere one of those strategies is called oculation which may be a new word for most folks it's literally just the same thing as if you've ever left a bucket sitting on your um, lawn and come back and the grass is dead under it so the idea is that whatever plants were um, there before you can actually terminate them with a tarp and then plant right into them. Really, the um, usefulness of the tarps varies on the time of year. So here, right now, it's about, feels like about 85 degrees. Um, and when it's this warm, these tarps work pretty quickly, especially on young weeds. If you wanna get something really tough, like grass, you're gonna need to leave it on longer. But for some young weeds in the heat, it works pretty quickly. So all you have to do is put down, I mean, first you have to source yourself some uh, opaque tarps, which isn't always so easy, but you can find them now in garden supply stores. Um, or you can, you know, if you if you can find, you be, it really needs to be totally opaque. So um, reusing garbage bags probably would work. Um, I haven't tried that, but it might work. 
since we're, we're doing it on this bigger scale. Um, and you can see actually these um, really tiny weeds here are um, pretty easy to kill, but you gotta get them all or else they will grow into really big weeds. Um, so underneath this tarp, you can see we only put this down a few days ago and you can actually see um, this difference here that these are called thread stage weeds. They're really young and see how the weeds really tried. They stretched and they tried to speak light and there just wasn't any. And so here they are um, just, you know, on their way out. So oculation is a great strategy for preparing ground um, to plant into without having to disturb the soil. Solarization is similar to oculation in that it uses mm, a not so regenerative material being plastic, um, but it works really differently in that it um, heats up the soil, the very surface of the soil to kill any weeds underneath. So again, it really only works on those thread stage weeds, those little weeds, but um, the soil gets so hot under the clear plastic that they, um, they die. And, um, you know, don't love using plastic on the farm. So there may be folks who really want to avoid that. Um, we've decided on our farm that it's a one-time purchase and it does last for many, many years. And then um, we are able to um, use it really strategically on the farm to avoid tillage. So ideally, we're gonna come up with, in the future, um, ways of smothering weeds without uh, this, this uh, bane of our modern moment plastic, but uh, for now, it's a pretty useful tool. So if you're using these no-till strategies, meaning ways of not um, turning over the soil or disturbing the soil, then something you might want to do is add a little air into the soil to loosen it up and aerate it. This is a broad fork. It's got tines down there and you can step right on it. Depending on your weight, you might have to wiggle or jump on it. But the idea is that you're getting you're getting those times down deep into the soil and then you're gonna loosen by just lifting and I've just introduced a little bit of air into there which will help the plant roots. Okay so let's say you're not quite ready to go all the way no-till and you've got some grass and you aren't gonna have you don't have a whole year to tarp it. it probably takes a whole year to kill grass with a tarp I mean not a whole year but um, quite quite a full hot season. Um, let's say you're not ready to go there. This is actually a great moment for me to segue into a side note, which is none of these regenerative approaches should be taken as dogma. You can use some of the regenerative approaches like no-till and then, you know, not use them in other moments. So if you do need to disturb the soil to start up your garden plot, um, you can start with a shovel. There's a technique called double digging. Um, and what you're going to do to double dig is you're going to dig one shovel depth. You're going to put it over here. You're going to do another shovel depth. You're going to put it over here. And then when you go, let's say, you know, you're going to go this far. That's your garden plot. And then you want to um, move upward this way to do a square. You're just going to take it and flip it and put it into... So take these weeds and literally flip them upside down and bury them there. And then you've got some nice loose aerated soil that, um, and you've also killed whatever plants were there before, smothered them. Um, double digging is a really classic useful approach. And again, it does disturb the soil, but you do it one time to get, get started and it can be an important and useful way to go. So a pretty aggressive way of disturbing the soil is called rototilling. It's incredibly useful because it really kills the crop that you had before or the cover crop and integrates it, mixes it all into the soil, brings a lot of air into the soil. Some of the problems with it is that it really disturbs the microbial life in the soil, which in regenerative gardening, that's your gold standard. You're going for as much biology in the soil as you can. Um, you really want to keep those soil layers intact and um, pay attention to the, the soil structure, which rototilling isn't so great for. Like I said, no dogma. Once in a while, we do rototill here on the farm. There are lots and lots of useful um, aspects to rototilling. And what it is, I've got it here on the back of the tractor, and it's a machine that um, has tines, and as they, ch -ch 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 -ch, they chop up the soil. 
I'm going to show you what that looks like. I'm going to turn the rototiller on and you can see the machine kind of turning and then you'll be able to watch what it does to this cover crop really mixes all those nutrients and organic matter into the soil and prepares it for the next crop. Once you've fertilized your area, you're watering it really well, what you're doing is you're making a perfect environment for plants to grow. So your carrots are going to like growing there, but so are all kinds of other plants. And you have to choose your crop over those other plants, unfortunately. You have to tell those other plants, sorry, this bed is for um, the carrots. I really love to remember that weeds, weeds are opportunists. They're, they're scrappy, they're really excited to like be in the place that you've made. And it's really a matter of perspective. A weed is just any plant that you don't want in your bed um, at any given time. So how are you gonna get them out? One way is by simply plucking them. And if your garden is small enough, you're literally just gonna pull them out by hand and it's gonna be no big deal. If you wanna use a hoe, there's different options. This is called a swan hoe. And what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna for my um, ergonomics, I'm gonna really work from my core and try to stay as upright as I can. And I'm just gonna scrape the surface of the soil. Again, this is a bit um, of soil disturbance. So to some extent, you might wanna um, try other methods. We'll talk in a second about mulching if you wanna avoid that soil disturbance. Um, but you can use a hoe. Here is a stirrup hoe. This has a blade on both sides and you can um, go back and forth with it and really scratch out the weeds that way. So another way to keep weeds out is to mulch. This is landscape fabric. So um, these eggplant and peppers are having their weeds kept out of them by um, not the, uh, cutting their weeds off from any light source with that fabric. And over here we have a straw mulch. Now straw mulch can be tricky because it can sometimes um, encourage slugs, it can encourage fungal disease, so you want to use it in the right places. Um, but it can be a really useful way to both maintain sort of um, an even soil moisture, an even soil temperature, and also to uh, exclude weeds. Of course, a common and not very regenerative approach to keeping weeds out is herbicides, meaning chemicals that kill weeds. Um, those have a lot of problems in terms of pollution in the long run but they're pretty effective. Another great way to keep your beds for your crops and your crops alone is mowing. So over there, Dina, who's working on the farm this summer, one of our Adama apprentices and an alum of our in-person fellowship program, she's back there and she is weed whacking down some of the vetch that's growing around these winter squash plants. So in this example, this is a great example of regenerative um, farming where we actually had a big cover crop here. We had rye, we had vetch, we had crimson clover, and it grew and grew and grew. We planted it last fall, and it grew um, all this spring and was huge, and then we mowed it all down, and then we literally planted our winter squash seedlings right into the uh, mulch, the, the, yeah, the, the residue of those crops, and um, now they're growing beautifully, and um, just to keep it all down, Dina is weed whacking some of that vetch that did sprout back. Interplanting means that you plant two crops together. Now that can be tricky to manage. You want to do it just right. Um, but when you do it just right, you get some good results. Like this bed of corn, these corn plants, they grow so incredibly fast. And um, it's actually almost the 4th of July here while I'm recording it. Tomorrow's the 4th of July. You like, there's an old idiom, you want your corn knee high by the 4th of July. But I don't know who's knee because this is pretty tall. Um, but when we planted them, they were, you know, we planted them from seedlings about this tall. And right next to them, we planted a crop of lettuce. The lettuce grew quickly. We harvested the heads of lettuce. It was using the space on this bed um, that the corn wasn't using until the corn started to get big enough right at the right time that we had already harvested all of the lettuce. So that's what interplanting is. So you've seen a lot of images of our farm. Your garden's going to look quite different because it's not quite so big, obviously. You might be growing in raised beds. You might have a frame um, and then have the soil inside of the frame. 
Um, you're probably going to have a lot fewer plants in each spot. Um, but the principles are really going to be the same. You're going to really want um, to rejuvenate the soil with as much organic matter as you can. You're going to try and avoid disturbing the soil whenever you can. Um, you're not going to beat yourself up when you do disturb the soil. Um, it, it's resilient. Um, and um, you're going to really look to the ecosystem as a, an integral part of your growing. So um, one of the things that we find really important on the farm is to have lots of habitat for beneficial insects. And what you can do in your garden is you can simply plant um, the kinds of crops that attract beneficial insects. And those crops, like um, whether it's just letting your dill flower or letting your cilantro flower, are going to really help you control pests by having habitat for the predators of those pests. Of course, the seeds you use are going to be really important. You're going to want, as much as possible, you're going to want to use seeds that are open pollinated for uh, regeneration. And what that means is that they're, they're not hybrids. They're seeds that uh, were um, produced through pollination um, by insects and wind and that kind of thing. So if you see an F1 next to your seed, that means it's a hybrid. Nothing wrong with using hybrids sometimes, but open pollinated seeds, those are the ones that really allow growers um, year to year to year to um, save their own seeds and benefit from the um, from the the amazing capacity that plants have to produce many many of themselves um, each year. So obviously the quality of your seeds is going to be really important. And one one other idiom that I like a lot about uh, farming is that the footsteps of a farmer are the best treatment for your field. Meaning that the more you observe, the more you notice, the more you pay attention to what you see, the more you're going to have end up with being able to respond to issues that pop up. And you're going to learn year to year 